On December 13, 1989, Scott Kingsley Swift and Andrea Gardner Swift had a bouncing baby girl in West Reading, Pennsylvania. Swift's daughter allegedly weighed 8 pounds and 4 ounces. That little baby girl grew up to who we all know today as Taylor Swift, or to some, T-Swizzle, one of the biggest names and most influential figures in music and pop culture. Since her debut into the world, Taylor steadily and patiently created her master plan on dominating the music world. Although she's only 34, it is hard to imagine a world without Taylor Swift and her influence today. Taylor Swift is the quintessential white artist of today. Despite all her praise and adoration, there's an equal amount of hate the singer gets. And that's expected, because anyone that's loved by many will be hated just as much. Lots of people can't wrap their minds around how insanely successful Taylor Swift is, calling Taylor basic and unseasoned. And there's lots of truth to that. I too admit that the singer has a pretty basic slash simplistic approach. Yes, Taylor Swift is basic, and it's her seemingly simplistic approach that attributes to her fame, and why she's widely popular. So for this video, let's go on a journey and talk about Taylor Swift, the basic lore of Taylor Swift, and the white girl aesthetic, how it helped her to prevail in the music industry. Taylor Swift is America's sweetheart. Her music and persona is easily digestible for the wide American audience. The singer also fits the criteria of what a humble human being should be, and the fact that she's famous makes her more appealing. Since her early years, Taylor wanted to be famous. She put in a lot of hours honing her craft. Being raised on a Christmas farmhouse in Pennsylvania did not face her from achieving her dreams. While vacationing in New Jersey on summer breaks, a young Taylor Swift would perform songs at a local coffee shop. Taylor was influenced by Leanne Rimes, the Dixie Chicks, and Shania Twain. When her family made the move to Wyoming, Pennsylvania, she attended Wyoming Area Junior Senior High School. Taylor performed in Burke's Youth Theater Academy Productions and traveled to New York City for vocal and acting lessons. She knew she wanted to be a country artist and that she had to make the move to country music's capital, Nashville, Tennessee, after watching a documentary about Faith Hill. And it's not surprising Taylor Swift's dreams were supported by her parents, as her parents were not poor, and they were both financially literate and stable. Her father was a stockbroker for Merrill Lynch, and her mother worked in marketing. Taylor and Andrea traveled to Nashville in hopes of getting a record deal, but they all turned Taylor down. When Taylor first went to Nashville, she was only 11, so people didn't take her seriously. And unlike pop music, country tends to have a more mature audience. So the singer then turned to songwriting and learning how to write on the guitar to give herself an edge. Not only that, she got a talent manager to build up her portfolio in the industry, booking a modeling gig with Abercrombie and Fitch, and had an original song included on Maybelline's compilation CD. At age 13, Swift signed an artist to development deal with RCA Records. To help his daughter break into the country music scene, Mr. Swift transferred to the Merrill Lynch's Nashville office when Taylor was 14, and the family relocated to Hendersonville, Tennessee. In 2005, the singer caught the attention of Scott Burchetta, former DreamWorks Records executive at an industry showcase. Burchetta initially met Taylor in 2004, where he made an offer to Swift and her parents, whereby he would recruit her to the new label's roster after it was established. Eventually, Taylor's father purchased a 3% stake in the label for an estimated $120,000, and Taylor became one of the first acts signed under Big Machine Records. Taylor Swift's debut self-titled album was released on October 24, 2006. The album spawned five singles from 11 autobiographical songs of love and heartbreak. Taylor Swift debuted at number 19 on the Billboard 200 chart, with 40,000 copies sold in its first week. In its 63rd week of charting, the project peaked at number 5 on the chart in 2008, proving to be a sleeper hit and a project that has staying power. The album marked the longest stay on the chart by any album released in the 2000s decade, changing the state of country music forever, as the project struck a chord with young teenage girls and has sold 7 million album equivalent units to date. Now, I didn't know a thing about Taylor Swift until 2008, the same year some of the greatest pop songs were released. I'm 
young money millionaire tougher than Nigeria. <laughs> The song that introduced me to Taylor was Love Story, off her sophomore project, Fearless, which had matching themes of her debut, Love and Life from a high school teenage girl's perspective. Other standout tracks from Fearless were White Horse, 15, and You Belong With Me, which peaked at number 2 on the Billboard Hot 100. The Fearless era was an iconic one. Taylor was emerging as a breakthrough act, and her hard work was finally paying off. She was winning awards, getting stamps of approval from the industry, and it was one of those industry events Taylor would be humiliated at a pivotal moment in her career. Labeled both a humiliating and an iconic moment in MTV history was the infamous moment Kanye West stupidly interrupted Taylor Swift's speech after the artist won Best Female Video at the 2009 VMAs. Taylor Swift, You Belong With Me, beat out Pink So What, Katy Perry's Hot and Cold, Lady Gaga, Poker Face, Kelly Clarkson's My Life Would Suck Without You, and Beyonce's Single Ladies, put a ring on it. Music, so thank you so much for giving me a chance to win a VMA award. I... Yo, Taylor, I, I'm really happy for you. I'm gonna let you finish. But Beyonce had one of the best videos of all time. One of the best videos of all time. Time for a controversial opinion. I think this helped Taylor. Yes, it wasn't a good look, but because of it, Taylor Swift was exposed to a different audience, black Americans, and hip-hop listeners because of Ye. Now, at that time, I had already know who Taylor Swift was, but I wasn't listening to anything outside of Love Story. However, after that moment with Kanye, I found myself actually downloading her music. Now, am I like a super fan? No, I'd say I'm a somewhat casual fan, as I do tend to pay attention to her moves. What I'm saying is, Kanye inserting himself on stage that night made a group of people that wouldn't give two shits about Taylor allowed for those people to give her music a chance. Unlike most artists today, Taylor Swift prides herself on being a songwriter. Her being a songwriter is part of her image. It helps to sell her authenticity as a musician, making her fans connect with her on a deeper level. Whatever she sings about, her fans believe it. Taylor Swift takes her craft seriously from the very start. Prior her first album, she left RCA because the label wasn't taking care of the work, as they wanted her to sing songs written by other people and have her work sent to other artists. At the age of 14, she felt like she was running out of time and needed to quickly make an album with tracks that details what she was going through at the time. There was also fear that her development deal would have her shelved by the label in the end. I genuinely felt that I was running out of time. I wanted to capture these years of my life on an album while they still represented what I was going through. It's this honest approach fans notice and makes them go really hard for her. In 2021, the National Music Publishers Association awarded Taylor with the Songwriter Icon Award and added, no one is more influential when it comes to writing music today. Taylor Swift has been compared to the likes of Shakespeare and even described as a poet to evoke how good her songwriting is, both by the industry and fans of her music. Now, let's dive into a few of the singer's lyrics. Anti-hero A song about the singer's personal failures off of her Midnight's album, released in 2022. Pew pew pew. In the second verse, Taylor sings, Sometimes I feel like everybody is a sexy baby, and I'm a monster on the hill. Too big to hang out, slowly lurching towards your favorite city. Pierced through the heart, but never killed. Sexy Baby, taken from the sitcom 30 Rock, created by Tina Fey. 
who made a joke about Taylor Swift in the past. I mean, monster on the hill, too big to hang out, solely lurching towards your favorite city. This could represent how Taylor sees herself or how others see her, like Godzilla. We know Godzilla is always fucking up some city near you, which could be a metaphor for her tours in big cities, or even her just going anywhere and getting all types of accolades for no real significant reason, other than the fact that she is Taylor Swift. And then there's, did you hear my covert narcissism? I disguise as altruism, like some kind of congressman. Taylor Swift is a good songwriter, but I wouldn't say she is the best because she mainly writes about herself. The writing is all about her and her experiences. I would more say she is great at telling a story, meaning the way she emotes and how she uses her voice to convey her feelings. And she is also good at making references, like in her recent song, Fortnite featuring Post Malone. I wanna kill her. And like that song, it's very basic, but there is an appeal in simplicity, especially when marketed well. It's very basic in my opinion, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's all strategy in songwriting. Basic songwriting does work, because then we, the audience, can check all the boxes and relate. And when you write about yourself and detailing events in your own style, the listener can draw whatever conclusion they want. You just need good melodies and catchy hooks. And the example I provided is just one of the most complex writings she has displayed, but for the most part, it's very simple and clean lyrics. For the most part, it's her references that make parts of her writing sound complex, and I'm not mad at it. Taylor Swift has impacted society like no other artist in decades. Some publications compare her mania to the Beatles. Now, I wasn't alive when the Beatles were killing it, but I do hear the stories and I've watched a few documentaries about them, and she is not far from them in terms of in terms of fan dedication. In the mid-2010s, Taylor Swift launched her female camaraderie, aka her girl squad, showing that she's a girl's girl and setting an example for young girls. It was a big thing then. So much so, the media asked Rihanna if she would join Taylor Swift's girl squad in 2015, to which she humbly declined. Courtney Love recently did an interview where she stated this about Swift. Taylor Swift is not important and noted that she might be a safe space for girls, and she's probably the Madonna of now, but she's not interesting as an artist. Now, with that being said, let's segue into how Taylor Swift beefs. In 2015, Apple launched its music streaming service, Apple Music, and to get people on board, the platform offered a 90-day free trial. In response, after releasing her album 1989, the singer wrote an open letter to the streaming service that her album 1989 wouldn't be available during the 90-day free trial. Three months is a long time to go unpaid, and it's unfair to ask anyone to work for nothing. We don't ask you for free iPhones. Please don't ask us to provide you with our music for no compensation. This is not about me. This is about the new artist or band that just released their first single and would not be paid for its success. In response, Eddie Q, Apple's senior vice president of internet services and software, confirmed that it was Swift's open letter that led to the change in policy. When I woke up this morning and saw what Taylor had written, it really solidified that we need to make a change. Q also stated that he called Taylor Swift directly when the company made the change. She's on tour in the UK and she was in Amsterdam. I wanted her to hear directly from us. We've had a long relationship with Taylor. She was thrilled and very thankful. You can tell by the letter she wrote that she's a great admirer of Apple and we've done a lot of work together. So she was really excited to see how quickly we responded and thrilled that we did. Now, this wasn't the first time Taylor Swift refused a streaming service as in 2014, she pulled all her music from Spotify. In 2016, Kanye West released Famous. On the track, the rapper declared he made Taylor famous. I feel like me and Taylor might still have sex. Why? I made that book famous. After getting backlash for the lyrics, Kanye declared that he got blessings from Taylor Swift herself to use her in his song. Furthermore, in the music video for the track, had a number of celebrities, nudes wax figures with Taylor Swift included, along with Rihanna, Chris Brown, George Bush, Caitlyn Jenner, Donald Trump, and even Kim Kardashian, which wasn't that shocking. 
In response, Swift's team denied that Kanye asked for her approval for the controversial lyric, with an official statement claiming that Swift had only been asked to release the song on her Twitter page, and had instead warned Ye not to release the track with such a strong misogynistic message. Kim Kardashian posted a three-minute recording of the phone conversation online, in which Swift can allegedly be heard approving the I made that bitch famous line, describing it as a compliment. Oh, okay, dope. You, you, still got, you still got the Nashville uh, number? I still have the Nashville um, area code, but I had to change it. For all my Southside niggas that know me best, I feel like me and Taylor might still have sex. I'm like this close to overexposure. Oh, well this, this one is, uh, I think this is a really cool thing to have. Uh, I thing to have. Uh, I know, definitely. it's like a compliment to myself. Yeah. <laughs> What I give a fuck about is just you as a person and as a friend. I want things that make you feel good. I don't want to do rap that makes people feel bad. Um, yeah, I mean, don't whatever line is better. It's obviously very tongue-in-cheek either way. And I really appreciate you telling me about it. That's really nice. Oh, yeah. I feel I just had a responsibility to you as a friend, you know. And, um, I mean, thanks for, um, I mean, thanks for being, like, so cool about it. Oh, thanks. Following the video's release, Swift released a statement saying, being falsely painted as a liar when I was never given the full story or played any part of the song is character assassination. So Taylor said Kanye did not tell her she would be referred to as a bull. Then Kim Kardashian would tweet about National Snake Day taking jabs at Taylor, causing hashtag Taylor Swift is a snake to trend on Twitter, which also caused Taylor Swift's social media pages to be flooded with the snake emojis. Now, Taylor Swift, proving that she is a savvy businesswoman, would use snake images in the promotional material of her sixth studio album, Reputation, released in 2017. Snakes were worked into the merchandise, the music video for its lead single, Look What She Made Me Do, and her 2018 Reputation Stadium tour. Then fast forward to 2020, the full conversation between Kanye and Swift was leaked on the internet, in which Kanye tells Swift about the line, I feel like Taylor Swift might owe me sex, and ask, what if later in the song, I was also to have said, uh, I made her famous. Swift objects that lyric, telling Wes she pulled 7 million off of Fearless before the 2009 VMA incident, which is not true, as by that time Fearless sold 3 million, which is still a lot, but you know what I mean. Maybe she made $7 million, but uh, anyway. After Kanye reveals the only sex line, Swift appears to be overly relieved that Kanye did not call her a bitch, saying, I'm glad it was not mean though. I thought it was gonna be like that stupid dumb bull. Not mean though. It doesn't feel mean. But like, oh my god, the build up you gave it, I thought it was gonna be like that stupid dumb bitch. Taylor Swift always comes out on top of her beefs, even if it takes a few years. She also had issues with Scooter Braun, who is her biggest foe to date. Their feud went as far back as 2016. Side note, Scooter was former manager of Kanye, Justin Bieber, and Ariana Grande. And things got more complicated when it was announced that Scooter Braun bought Big Machine Records, Taylor Swift's former label, which owns the masters for her albums on the label. After Braun's acquisition of Big Machine made headlines in July 20. 2019, Taylor Swift slammed the business deal via Tumblr. The singer claimed that for years, she'd pleaded for a chance to own her own work, but was instead given an opportunity to sign back to Big Machine Records and earn one album back at a time, one for every new one I turned in, stated the artist. Now, in the end, what ended up happening, Taylor and her lawyers found a loophole in her contract with her old label. Taylor Swift was then able to re-record her old albums that she made while under Big Machine, making the deal Scooter Braun made useful as Taylor has a loyal fan base, causing Braun to sell her masters to a company called Shamrock Holdings. And although Taylor didn't get to buy back her masters, she was able to sign a different deal with Republic, where both parties agreed she would own her masters for albums released through them. Taylor Swift currently has 11 studio albums, if you don't count her re-recorded albums. Her first three albums were country projects until her fourth, Red, released in 2012. Oh, never, ever, 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 ever. Back 
The album marked Taylor's crossover into full pop, which received praise but left some critics mixed on what Taylor was trying to do artistically. For me personally, I think her first albums were more interesting sonically and even lyrically. Despite her being a lot younger, she followed up Red with 1989 to prove her critics wrong about her status as a pop artist, making it clear she can cross over as a bona fide pop star, releasing explosive pop tunes like Shake It Off. And of course, she got personal with the single Style. and Blank Space, which saw Taylor leaning into the bad guy reputation and all the negative perspectives she garnered over her career. "1989" stands as the singer's best-selling album with over 14 million copies sold worldwide. Then, we were lured into her dark era with 2017's Reputation. It follows Taylor Swift when her status in the public and the media was at its lowest. Coming off of the high of 1989, and the album was her way of damage control after she was painted as a villain following the incident with Kanye and Kim Kardashian. She then released Lover in 2019, and from 2020 to 2022, she released three albums, Folklore, Evermore, and Midnights. During these projects, the singer's work got more cinematic and had shades of Lana Del Rey and Lord. And now we're in 2024, and a singer released her most polarizing work to date, in my opinion, The Tortured Poets Department which extended into a double album subtitled The Anthology, 31 songs in total with a runtime of 2 hours. On this project, after the first 5 songs, the rest of the songs kind of bleeds into each other, making the entire album sound like one song. It's an exhausting listen, with how her vocal range doesn't change much and the production sounding the same. But despite these issues I have with the album, I feel like the concept, it's like reading someone's diary in a dome. And I think that was intentional. It's just so jarring. I see the vision. I see the appeal. It's just too long and boring. What I admire the most about Taylor Swift is how she stays true and grounded throughout her career. While most white artists nowadays lean into black aesthetics, example over tanning to literally look black or mixed, or incorporating way too much trap in their music, and adopting both a black scent and black culture. Taylor Swift has aesthetically and sonically stayed the same, a white woman who just loves her cats, writes songs filled with references and easter eggs for her fans, and that's why she is so successful. She is a basic artist, and a lot of people sees themselves in her, and her music can be played anywhere. It's the normalcy and how she packages it that makes her the most influential artist of her generation. Taylor is a marketing genius. She is a genius at what she does, and she is noteworthy with other legends in music because of how far she has come and how much more she is yet to give.